Hi, I'm Nicole Laracy, and this is the overview lecture for the play Native Son. And so what I really am going to be doing is posing some questions, but not necessarily answering all of those questions, pointing out some of the themes, and sort of looking directly at a few of the scenes. We'll see how far we get. So I think that this play has a complex set of tones, hope, despair, warning, fear, explanation even. And I wonder if you were producing this play, which of those tones would you ultimately decide on? So let's take it moment by moment and see what we can look at. I think that some of the major themes that come up, particularly in Act One, are religion versus violence versus self-protection and how all of those things are related to free will. So for Biggers specifically, what do you think about Biggers' tendency towards violence? Or for that matter, humanity's tendency towards violence? How would or does being stereotyped as violent exacerbate or repress this violence? And then what does Biggers' name mean? In Act 1, Scene 1, the incinerator is mentioned, and that is an important piece of foreshadowing. I wonder about Hannah in this scene, and I wonder about Vera. Does Vera really think her kids can transcend their situation? What gives her such hope? And that question leads me to the question of naming in the play. What about the name Hannah? It's different than the name that's in the novel. Who is Hannah in the Christian Bible? In Act 1, Scene 2, themes of communism, citizenship, and then loyalty and citizenship come up. Communism and citizenship versus loyalty and citizenship arise. I see in this scene some painful stereotyping with Jack's watermelon line, and I wonder if that makes you uncomfortable too. For Bigger in this expositional scene, I feel that he seems much less innocent than he did than in the movie or in the book. And I wonder what decisions went into this set of choices that created a less innocent exposition for bigger than in the other genres of the story. The plane fantasy, for instance, paper planes versus war planes. He's graduated to war planes in the play. Bigger seems much more mature to me in this version of the story, whereas the movie relies more on the audience imagination and reception. Here he has much more developed community in the exposition. He's much less alone. He also seems more trigger happy, more ready for action. I wonder about Buddy too, is he totally naive? What does he see? What does he know? Again, what does his name mean? And in this scene with Bigger, he is in competition. He's trying to be the leader and also to transcend his own class location. I think these are conflicting goals for the character. He wants to lead this group, but he doesn't want to be a part of this group. In Act 1, Scene 3, the notion of the color complex is introduced by Dalton, and then the furnace is mentioned by Dalton, so there's more foreshadowing. Peggy talks about courage and help and having one talent. Does she believe that life is this simple? Do you believe that success is this simple? Do we believe that everyone can pull oneself up by one's own bootstraps and then be successful, no matter the social barriers? For Mrs. Dalton, this character is highly symbolic, and I'll be looking at this throughout my reading of the play. In scene, Act 1, Scene 3, what does Mrs. Dalton's flowers symbolize? I see themes of individual selfhood arising here versus the nation versus nationalism. The clover patch seems to represent a new start. And then we're introduced to Mary, and again, who is Mary in the Bible? How knowing is Mary? Is she aware of her power? And is she aware of the aggressions behind the way she behaves? What does she protect? Is she crazy? Is she mocking bigger? In Act 1, Scene 4, I wonder how this could be set up. Is it innocent or powerful? 
who was innocent, who was powerful in this scene. The treachery seems to be in the powerful weakness, the innocent aggression, the naive violence. So themes here are of the penitent rich. Mary is drunk and dead inside, and she says, I wish I was black. How is this terrible line delivered? For Bigger, why does the encounter so unmoor and disturb him? Mrs. Dalton says, poor child, how did I fail you? There's this notion of impotent white guilt without action or sight. So Miss Dalton's blindness is highly symbolic. It means a lot in this story. And then we have this question of the accidental murder. How do we motivate it though? Is it instinctual action? He has to be very afraid of something and it has to come from these two white women, what he's afraid of. Why are white women so dangerous to black men? To answer that question, you might want to watch Birth of a Nation by Deputy Griffith, one of the first movies. And it talks about this psychosis of fear that white um, society has against the black male. But it's a result of the slave culture in which actually the rapes were happening the other way around. Because white men will do anything to protect the daughters from the extreme dangers that they imagine black men pose to them. And that is what Bigger knows he's in trouble about. There's often uncomfortable laughter at that murder. Um, and in the viewing of it, it seems so improbable and so sudden. In Act 1, Scene 5, the themes seem to be that they assume Bigger is innocent, so this question of assumed innocence, and I think it's really important that they don't immediately point to him as a suspect. The defense attorney here is an important character. What does that connection connote or symbolize? In general, I think with African American literature and particularly here, we need to have an understanding of the notions of masking and signifying in African American literature. And you can read about that from Henry Louis Gates Jr. Going back to Africa, this is the method of storytelling where the writer and characters will say one thing but mean another in order to invert the power structure or will appear one way but be another way in order to get one over or get power subversively and indirectly. We see that the law is aware of this when he asks Bigger if, when the, the law asks if Bigger appears more ignorant than he is or if he is alert yet impassive on page 49. Bigger killed his most powerful ally. Why? Again, the themes of communism come in and it's interesting that the characters initially suspect the communists more than the Negro employee and I wonder why that is. What's happening at the nation at the time to make communism more suspect? than the African-American employee. Themes of the individual versus the communal togetherness get heightened in this scene where Peggy protects Bigger in a movement toward the we. Her employee is we, whereas the communist is they. And at one scene six, we're introduced to Clara, which is a really great name. What, again, does that mean? And we have this juxtaposition between Clara and Mary, and they seem to be foils for one another who contrast, they're contrasting images of womanhood. It would be an interesting paper, the comparison between Clara and Mary. Why does Bigger resent Clara and yet go to her at the same time? Again, he wants to transcend his class position. He feels that Clara will keep him back, but he also wants the best of what his current situation has to offer. Clara is the best of his current situation, but he doesn't think he can move up in his class situation with Clara. There's a notion of a now versus then going on in this scene with baptism and light. Pay attention to that imagery. What is Clara's motivation to be with, with Bigger? And is this her first view of his gun? Why does Bigger give Clara the money if he distrusts her so? Clara quickly wonders if Bigger has done something to Mary. 
How does she know? Is she clairvoyant, like her name seems to suggest? Figure is against the thousands. He is beginning to be set up as an isolated individual against the collective mass. There is a collective society um, that enforces racism and isolates and separates the individual. In scene nine, um, let's see. Oh, I want to go to scene seven, I'm sorry. For scene seven, the whiteness of Mrs. Dalton becomes highly symbolic. She's wearing a white dress, she has a white cap. What do they signify? It's easy enough to understand the faces, but what about the white and the whiteness? She tries to reason out cause and effect, but when she tries to do so, she tries to do good, sorrow comes to her. There seems to be something about fate going in or justice coming into this character. Bigger has a very delicate, fragile grasp on his self-control. Is this the same thing as his losing his free will? Could he be said to have lost his free will when he lost his self-control to such an extent that he killed an innocent woman? Norris begins to question Bigger about the speech. He's trying to calm him down because he already knows what happened, maybe, or is he hoping it's the communist problem instead of the color problem? What did he say to you about white women, he asks. Wait, there's an age-old bottom line fear that divides our country. Ultimately, the fear between the races is going to win over the fear against communism in the story. And then why does Norris all of a sudden assume rape? In scene eight, um, why does Bigger think they're scared of him? Is he right about why he thinks they're scared of him? Mr. Trueblood is telling the incest rape story to the whites for their entertainment. Um, similar, um, oh, there's a, a, a parallel um, story in, let me start over on that. There's a parallel story in Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, where Mr. Truebud tells the story of incest and rape for white entertainment. So one of the things that happens is there seems to be a viewing audience of what happened to Bigger, and they're entertained by it. There are escape monologues here echoing the monologue about airplanes at the beginning. It's a big relief when Bigger finally gets to speak for himself about what happened during the accidental murder. And he begins to know about the collective consciousness that's against him when he says, all the white folks in the world are rolled into one. He swears to God, and I think that's the only reference to God or faith in the play that he utters. He says he hated her. Why did he hate Mary? Because like Clara, he sees her standing in his way. Why does Clara then have a death wish? Why does her heart die when she sees what Bigger has become? Where is her self-will and her selfhood beyond Bigger? So Bigger again is developed as Bigger against the thousands as an isolated individual. In scene nine, there's an attempt at community, even from the Daltons, which Bigger rejects and can't accept. We begin to look at this question of the curse of sin versus free will and salvation in the afterlife. And that seems to be Hannah's, the mother's only hope, the salvation in the afterlife. Uh, and, and somehow Bigger's dead father gets to correspond with Jesus in this scene. And Bigger has no faith in anything except himself at first. And then it, as this is eroded against his own fearful actions, he begins to have no self-control because he has no faith. Maybe that's what that scene means. In scene 10, Bigger's masking is thickened and unyielding. He becomes more and more invisible, unknowable, and unseeable. He begins to be envisioned like a black ape, even as he says racism has nothing to do with it. His character becomes somewhat subhuman. And I wonder about Richard Wright's motivation for this. What is he creating and why? 
I think Richard Wright may himself be the defense attorney in the story. He puts us all on trial. Wright puts us all on trial. And then I begin to wonder about current events. What must it have been like in the Ferguson courtroom? Were these things still on trial, the same things? Certainly the individuals of the case were not the only thing being tried in Ferguson. Do you think the defense attorney is right in scene 10, that he is himself in the murder, or more likely he was what he got, he was groomed in a culture to become, which was not himself? In scene 11, Bigger makes Max feel how badly men want to live in the world. He's trembling and afraid. And there's a sharp distinction between Bigger with his people and his friends versus Bigger in this White House. The trembling and afraid non-person versus the man taking leadership and agency. And then on page 97, there's a third Bigger is his confession, and at last, there is no mask. There's an unveiling, a revealing, he becomes visible. He's singled out of society, culture, and civilization. And then there becomes a sort of communist manifesto, like Karl Marx, and you begin to see Wright's investment in communism and the collective identity. The audience in this scene is called to witness to the testimony, as in all protest literature, and having witnessed, the audience is called to go on and make a change. This scene, scene 11, is a call to action. Alongside these readings, you might want to read some Langston Hughes, uh, which we'll do in the future, future of the course. You might want to watch Birth of a Nation. You might want to read some excerpts from W.E.B. DuBose's Soul of Black Folks. Um, again, the text, How Bigger Was Born. There are some resources listed um, in the print version of these notes. If you want to read more upper level criticism or more details about the interpretation of the novel.